something might be building and there's a moment of impact and you see this energy release and everyone's feeling that together, including myself. It's one of the best feelings in the world. And this links to something you and I have discussed before, which is music being the universal language. Welcome to Dialogue Creates, more than talk, where we explore issues and solutions together through the lens of dialogue. Thank you for joining your hosts, Susan Taylor and Hitta Vanderpool. Hey, Leon. Hi, Susan. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Dialogue Creates, more than talk. And you see, I've got my other partner in crime here, Leon Jaworski who is um, not only someone I've known since he was a lot younger, itty bitty, um, but someone who I am now working with. So we have a personal connection. We have a professional connection. And um, now we've got another connection, which we're going to talk with all of you about shortly around music. And in that connection, I just want to share and give a big shout out to you, Leon. Leon is the one who makes all the magic happen with these podcasts He is the creator of our fade in and fade out music. He does all the editing. He helps us with our green screens and different visuals. So just wanted to say how thankful Hitta and I are for you, Leon, as is everyone else at Generon. And I'm so happy that you and I are going to have about 25 minutes or so to talk about something that's really, really special to our hearts. And that is music. So maybe you could just give us a little bit of an intro. Um, You, your music. What makes you tick? What are you excited about? And then we'll get in later, I think, uh, how it all connects to dialogue. Absolutely. Uh, Thanks, Susan. I'm Mm -hmm. so excited to be here. And music has been a huge part of my life, uh, as you know personally. For our viewers and listeners, it's always been something that I've been drawn to. I started off early playing guitar and singing and played in some bands and music has always been a driving force in my life. Performing has always been a happy place for me. So being able to tie those in together and continue in my musical journey in my life has really been one of the greatest pleasures. Lately, uh, I would say actually over the last 20 years, I've DJed professionally, which has been a lot of fun. Played in a lot of nightclubs, bigger clubs. Electronic music holds a really dear place in my heart, even though I came from organic, traditional instruments. It's been really fun to watch a dance floor come together as I'm playing, or as any other DJ is playing. And I take that as a great honor and it's a powerful position to be in to set a vibe and bring everybody together in harmony and dance. And Mm -hmm. that's always an exciting thing for me. Absolutely. So you say you were trained in more traditional ways, as was I. So music's been a big part of my life as well. As you know, I started taking piano um, as a requisite to be in my family at six years old. And my sister and I had to take piano lessons until we were 16, at which point we could make our decision about, you know, whether we wanted to continue. Um, And so you mentioned something similar with regard to some of the fundamentals around music and organic, and yet you ended up in this uh, area of electronic music. What brought you there and why is it so important to you now? It's, It's a great question. I remember as I was young and in the mid, late 80s, early 90s, hearing more synthesized instruments being introduced into music. And originally, I was of this impression that anything electronic wasn't real musicianship. Oh, the irony in that for me today. (laughs) (laughs) However, that was also a really cool part of my journey. I remember as 
a teenager, maybe around 14, 15 years old, someone introduced me to electronic music, gave me a CD, an album, and I was so fascinated by it. I listened to this album on repeat. I I just couldn't stop because there was always something new for me to latch on to and to discover as a musician. When I listen to music, often I, I like to pick out individual parts as I'm listening to a song. Maybe I'm focused on the drums for a bit. Maybe I'm focused on the guitar. Maybe then the vocals. Well, when you get into electronic music, a lot of it is layered. And there's so much ability to create nuance and detail. And I'm a very detail-oriented person, so that really appeals to me. I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and and it really struck me in a way that I, I listened. Mo- most people might create an album as a listening experience. A lot of rock bands do, and how the flow of an album goes is important. In this particular context, I found that the entire album really was a journey for me. There's a lot of different emotion and things like that. Well, after listening to that and having my eyes truly open to what electronic music could be, I was invited to go to uh, some events. People call them raves. They're raves. (laughs) I went to some on the East Coast, and this experience really changed everything for me. I love playing in bands. However, there's always this element when you have so many people together trying to create music, you have conflicting schedules sometimes. And as a kid, you have conflicting schedules with your parents too. So (laughs) I realized that if I wanted to really perform and, and take this seriously, it would be more effective for me to be a one man band. After seeing these DJs perform, that's what that felt like to me. Mm -hmm. So once I moved from the East Coast, I'm now based in Minneapolis. And once I moved to Minneapolis, I really took it upon myself to start engaging more in this community. And I learned a lot from watching. And eventually one of my friends bought a set of turntables. I started buying vinyl records and teaching myself how to mix music with vinyl. It was a steep learning curve, but it was so fascinating. And that started my my journey that way. I love it. I love it. Of course, as you could probably imagine, because you know me so well, as I was listening to you, the first thing that came into my heart and mind was around wholeness. This idea that we need every element or we need every part. And how that creates unity, how that creates harmony when you bring all those parts together. And it reminded me growing up as a kid, I'm a lot older than you are. (laughs) And so one of the, (laughs) I weren't going to do this more often. (laughs) Um, I remember one of my, my dad's favorite things to do was to listen to um, Dixieland jazz, Dixieland jazz. My dad was a very accomplished musician. Um, and so you can see how it then, you know, went from generation to generation. So I've been to a lot of Dixieland jazz festivals and and performances in my day. And one of the things that I loved about Dixieland jazz was that they would all start playing together. And then each person with each instrument would get a solo opportunity, right? And it didn't happen in a way that was choreographed. It happened in a way where the music was felt, the rhythm. So I think about dialogue and rhythm, right? When you're in the rhythm of of what it means to be in dialogue and and, and the flow and the wholeness that that creates. So what you were sharing really lifted that up for me, which I deeply appreciate. A really pleasant memory um, from when I was younger and and something my dad truly loved. And as part of that, I want to kind of maybe see uh, what you think about that kind of a connection and how music plays a role in really bringing that connective tissue or that harmony, that unity together. What do you have to share around this idea of music and connection? I love that you said memory. For (laughs) me, 
that's a strong connection. Just just to grab that for a moment. Smell, sound, all of these different senses that we are able to experience. And music is very powerful for me in terms of memory. I remember how I felt when I heard a certain song after a breakup. I remember how I felt when I was upset around something and and used music as a way to release. And in that, I connected with the artist who created that music because they were feeling something. Emotion is one of the most powerful ways that music translates and speaks to people, in my opinion. So around connection, when we can share an emotional state, even if someone's emotions that they're feeling are different than mine or different than the, than the person standing or dancing next to them, we're all feeling something. And in the world of, of these really awesome experiences in a dark room with artistic lighting and these big sound systems and being at the helm of something like that, as I said, feels quite powerful, not from an egotistical standpoint, but from a, st- a standpoint of, wow, I'm in, a, I'm in a role of responsibility. I'm controlling the environment to an extent for these people. And I always come into that with true intention and a desire to bring people together. And that, for me, links to something that has been going on for millennia. It feels tribal. It feels connected. It feels, I almost visualize sometimes when I'm on stage that I see these threads of energy connecting each of the people on the dance floor. And when there's those moments that I set up intentionally in a performance, in a set where something might be building and there's a moment of impact and you see this energy release and everyone's feeling that together, including myself, it's one of the best feelings in the world. And this links to something you and I have discussed before, which is music being the universal language. It doesn't matter where I am internationally in the United States or people who might not be familiar with any certain language. When we're in those moments together, the music is the language. And that is speaking to everybody all at once. It's, I know people have experienced this. For me, it's why I keep doing it because I just want to keep experiencing that. Absolutely. That's beautiful, Leanne. And we have talked about music as a universal language and I would say akin to love. Because when I envision what you're sharing with these beautiful, energetic connections with all these people on the dance floor, with the lights doing their thing and you playing with the different components of what make up the orchestra or the band in in this case, and then link that to even someone maybe who has a hearing disability, right? They can still feel that vibration, right? The vibe in their body, it's somatic. It's somatic and they can still pick up the way that you're kind of, I would offer maybe communicating with all of those people on the dance floor in a way that sets conditions, not to control. And I I know what you meant by control. Um, And as I'm linking it to dialogue, it's more setting the field. That's how we talk about it, at least um, in in, in dialogue lingo, (laughs) you know, setting that vibe, setting that frequency, setting that container, the conditions for this amazing, not just connection, but I would offer communication. So maybe riff on that a little bit. What comes up for you around communication and music? Yeah. Oh, I love this so much. (laughs) I remember uh, early on before I, in that early part of my journey, before I was into the electronic music as much, 
I remember writing these songs with my guitar and even as an adolescent, spending a lot of time doing that. And as music often does, it came from a place of an emotional state. I had a breakup or a girl I really liked didn't reciprocate that and the angsty teenage life, right? <laughs> but it was a way for me to release and to communicate that. And I recall a really cool part of my high school journey where I was playing in a band. We were doing classic rock cover songs and I loved all that too, but we played some of the originals that I wrote. And the theater group at our school liked one of the songs so much, they ended up using that as their performance piece and singing it themselves and doing mm -hmm. a whole choreography around a song that I wrote. It, it was humbling. It made me proud. And more importantly, that was maybe the first time where I really saw that, that something I was doing from the heart in order to share with people authentically, truly made an impact. It made enough of an impact where people wanted to share that from their own perspective. So as I talk about this, and as I think about music and communication, when I'm performing on stage now, my choices in the songs I play, whether they're my original works or great music that I really seek and dig deep for, as we call it in the world of DJing, I try to find these songs, these ways of tying these songs together that takes us on a journey that really maybe one song communicates a specific emotion. And I might use that song to just bring things down for a minute and give some rest, give some pause. And with that, maybe the next thing I choose starts to bring the energy, or maybe it's a stark contrast with energy, and it gives it even more impact after having that rest, after having that pause. So in communicating these things, I might find something that's melodic and, and maybe a little more thought-provoking, or I might find something that's a little more stripped down and driving so you get that visceral feeling, feeling versus being in the head so much. And there's all of these different ways that you can tie these things together. One of the most interesting things I find in this is I could, and I, and I teach uh, music production and DJing, so I use this example with my students often who are learning how to DJ from me. I could take, let's just say, even a list of five songs in the same order. And every time I go to play that playlist, let's say, Every time it's going to come out differently because the way I'm melding those songs and the way I'm mixing and the way I'm using the tools at hand will always be different. Because in one moment, I might have a certain creative idea. In another moment, I might be feeling a different way. I also like to read the crowd. So as I'm watching the audience, how are they reacting to what I'm doing? If I throw a curveball that's a little challenging for them, and sometimes I like that discomfort, <laughs> but do I lose too many people? And do I need to then come back to a place of comfort to bring them in? For me, I like to really create trust in my audience so that during the course of my performance, I can take those hard left turns or hard right turns sometimes and challenge not only the audience, but myself to stay engaged when we do something a little different, a little uncomfortable that actually in turn really enhances the experience because we've done something new. Yeah. Two big things come to mind. I actually got the goosebumps when you were sharing about how you might pause or slow the cadence. And then maybe at one point, you know, pick it up again and, of course, linked to dialogue and David Bohm, one of the first things that came to my mind anyway was about unfolding. So this emergent unfolding, and yet 
David Bohm talked a lot about unfolding and enfolding. And the quick kind of headline around that is the mighty oak tree is already in the acorn. So I can see the whole composition is already in just one element. And then how you're building on the audience in a way that does require trust because you're not dictating, so to speak, what they should do based on the rhythm or the beat or the tempo or the volume or the pause. You're creating an environment of trust. I think you used the word trust, which really, um, as we come to the last five minutes or so in in our conversation, um, is raising this idea of you know vulnerability, right? So I'm thinking of DJ, music, lights, dancing. And when I thought of it in that uh, way, I was reminded of something that happened when I was um, was six years old. I had just seen Singing in the Rain. On the for the first time on television, my, one of my dad's favorites. And the next day happened to be a rainy day, and I was out there in my uh, clear um, bubble shaped umbrella <laughs> on the back patio of where I lived in Illinois, um, singing and dancing in the rain. And my father took a picture of me that I didn't know about. And um, as I got older, he would have it in front of him all the time, and he um, linked it to this quote: this idea that. Life is not waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. So as I was thinking about that, and yet I'm going to use the word memory again that you've lifted here for me, which is so beautiful, Leon, linking back to trust and vulnerability, right? And what it means for some of us, myself included, actually, to get on that dance floor or to feel that emotion that, uh, that is being you know, invoked through, through your sounds. Speak to that a little bit, trust, vulnerability. Absolutely. That's something even outside the world of music, as you and I know in dialogue, and I believe a lot of people align with this. In order to really have trust and and truly be able to experience that with someone, there needs to be a certain level of vulnerability. Trust is often earned Sometimes it can be given, but mostly we understand that trust is earned because when we are vulnerable, we're not holding up a barrier. We're not holding up our protection, and it requires that to access trust. So as I tie this into the dance floor, the audience is trusting me to provide an experience for them that they can engage in, one that I hope remains memorable. And I'm trusting the audience to give me feedback. And for me, that feedback is, wow, look how people are losing their minds right now. Or (laughs) look how people are just in it, heads down, just doing their own thing. They're dancing. I hear a lot in our culture, dance like nobody's watching. Mm. And I love that because that is a physical exhibition of vulnerability. Who cares if you look silly to someone else? You're having fun. (laughs) You're doing what your body wants to do organically. And it's a a really beautiful element of what I, I love about the world of DJing, about the rave culture, club culture. And this is, it. I see it internationally. It happens everywhere. Again, linking back to that tribal feeling. But this element of trust, I find, happens naturally when I put my heart completely into what I'm doing. And it's so important to me always give 100% of myself to a performance from a pragmatic standpoint, because how can I expect my audience to enjoy what I'm doing if I don't look like I'm having fun, right? So I'm willing to be vulnerable first. I'm willing to show that I'm not too good to dance like nobody's watching when everybody's watching me. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) And I love that. 
And I hope that that extends through the choices I make as I'm performing. And I'm very grateful because often I, I do have people come up to me after a show and, and offer really kind words of, of feedback and support and essentially confirming that I was able to reach the goal I set out to do. Wonderful. I love that so much because when I link it to the real reason that I believe David Bohm discovered this thing we call dialogue with a capital D is really about what you just spoke to, which is dissipating those boundaries that we put around us in ways that when they can come from love and trust, create an environment where everyone can be seen and heard and valued even from very different perspectives, even when different points of view, in other words, are at play. And how, if we can just hold that space for all of ourselves to be seen and therefore heard and valued, even when someone disagrees or doesn't condone something that I might believe in, it creates that space where the the boundaries start to dissipate. And as the boundaries dissipate, like peeling away the layers of the onion, we get to that core space of love, if I may use that word, um, from which all collective intelligence, I think, emerges in ways that are uh, for good. And for me, that's really what I believe David Bohm was after and why he felt that dialogue and being in dialogue as a way of being could potentially be an antidote for war. It could create world peace from his perspective. So as we come to a close here, what's coming up, Leon, is I heard through the rumor mill, if you will, (laughs) that you and one of the participants actually in one of our dialogue courses are going to be doing something pretty magical that involves music. So love to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about that before we conclude our conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this. This is actually going to be our second year. And we are co-hosting an intimate gathering on my friend's beautiful 30-acre property just north of Minneapolis here, about an hour north. There's meadows, walking trails, forests. In the woods, he and his uh, partner have built this beautiful wood-fired sauna with cold plunge baths and a wood-fired hot tub. And they call it thermic cycling. It's a really powerful way to invigorate the body. We are also really focusing this event to be a way to bring community together. This is about community centered around music or sound, really, and wellness and We're really excited. This year, we've had some of our past attendees, some of which who, this was very humbling, uh, told us that their experiences last year had changed their lives. And no greater honor could be bestowed, in my opinion. So we, we are so glad that these people are coming back, not only as attendees, but to share their experiences and to share their music. One of them, in fact, wrote an album as a result of inspiration from her experience at this event last year. So it's very intimate, but it's an opportunity to bring people together through sound, through meditation, through dialogue. We will absolutely be hosting uh, opportunities for dialogue. We're doing a woodland dance party last year. This was such a hit at the event. My friend and Travis, one of the co-owners of the land, performed. We DJed under the stars at the edge of the forest overlooking one of the meadows. We had some fire pits going and there happened to be a full moon that night. And it was such a powerful experience. Exactly what we've just been talking about in this episode. Again, so organic and... One of the biggest things that I think 
well, I know you align on is nature brings people together. Nature grounds us. So this is a way for people to feel community, use sound, wellness, and nature to recharge, maybe disconnect from the regular hustle and bustle. It's a three-day camping event, and we're so excited. So uh, more information on that can be found on the website. The property is called Silve Spiritus. That's spelled S-I-L-V-A-E. S P I R I T U S. So based here too, so I had to think about it. And if you go sylvispiritus.com slash interbeing, that's the name of our event series, interbeing04. And we'll post the link in, in the comments here for everybody to follow. But we're very excited about it. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to share about that as well today, Susan. Yeah, absolutely. I love this idea of, you know, creating community through sound, nature, and well-being. And um, yeah, we'll definitely put the link and any other information you want, um, I guess, pointing down below underneath the video, (laughs) just like those YouTubers do, right? Um, This has been so awesome. This has been such a joy. I know that we will be doing more of these together, um, also with Hida, and uh, just really wanted to share authentically how much I appreciate you and how I so enjoyed um, this particular podcast because it's something that's also very much a part of my life and and always has been since, you know, I can remember. So as we are um, getting ready to sign off, I just want to thank our listeners uh, for joining us today. Leanne Jaworski, myself, Susan Taylor, More Than Talk, Dialogue Creates, and I don't know, Maybe this session is more about music, more than music, (laughs) music and beyond. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Please engage with us in the comments. Let us know if you have ideas for future episodes. We love interacting and engaging with you all. So don't be shy. Thank you. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you for participating with us. Please visit our LinkedIn page to share your thoughts, questions, and suggestions for future episodes. Remember to like us, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this has been More Than Talk.